الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا صلى الله عليك يا سيدتي ويا مولاتي يا زهراء صلى الله عليك يا بنت رسول الله أيتها الشهيدة المظلومة رزقنا الله في الدنيا زيارتكم أهل البيت وشفاعتكم في الدنيا والآخرة لولا سقوط جنين فاطمة لما أودى لها في كربلاء جنين وبكسر ذاك الضلع رضات أضلاء في طيها سر الإله مصون وكذا علي قوده بنجادة فله علي بالوثاق قرين وكما لفاطم رنة من خلفه لبناتها خلف العلي الرنين وبزجرها بسياط قنفذ والشحايا آه بويا خلاف عينك ما رعوني قومك يا بويا لوعاني ومن البكي عليك منعاني ورا الباب لما نهيسوني اكسروا ظلعي ابويا وسقطوني آه وبزجر يا بسياط قنفذ والشحايات 
بالطف من زجر لهون متون لكنما حمل الرؤوس على القنايا أيوة إماما أيوة حسين لكنما حمل الرؤوس على القناة وإن سبقت به صفي كل كتاب الله لكن هذا صامت وهذا ناطق ومبين ينشال ينشال خويا انا قلب جرح جرح ما بعد ينشال عسى شف الدهر يحسين ينشال ينشال راسك فوق راس الرموح ينشال عجيبة وجثتك فوق الوطية يا عجيبة وجثتك فوق يا الوطن يا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يريدون ليطفئوا نور الله بأفواههم والله متم نوره ولو كره الكافرون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد There was an American psychologist from German origins by the name of Kurt Lewin. Kurt Lewin, about 80 years ago, give or take, established something called the group dynamics theory. What is it? Basically, he did a series of experiments and at the end of the experiments, he came up with the conclusion that an individual, a person, behaves differently as an individual compared to when you put him with a group, the group dynamics. And that's what he called the group dynamics theory. One of the experiments he did, he went to some schools where they have some children that are troublemakers. These children, every now and then, they're sent to the principal's office. So they're at the principal office. The principal, that sounds familiar with you guys? No? Yeah, I hope you're not that, that those children, I hope. Yeah. When the child goes to the principal's office, often what happens, the principal talks to the child, tells him, for example, you cannot do this, etc., or maybe give him a suspension in severe cases. The child comes back, goes to class, what happens? Anything changes? No, not much changes. Because the environment is still the same. The dynamics are still the same. So what he did is he went to these schools, took these kids out. He put them in a different school or different schools where there is more discipline in these environments. Eventually, he saw that those same students who are the troublemakers, their behavior changes slowly. Why? Because the environment, the dynamics of the group has changed now. And therefore, slowly, those individuals started to change. 
So these were among the experiments that he conducted. So here is an advice to you brothers. If these guys are troublemakers, you know what to do now, inshallah. Okay. Alhamdulillah. No, yeah. Just change the dynamics of the group. Inshallah, everything will be good. But I'm sure you're not those ones, are you? You're the, you're the good ones, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. You're the disciplined ones. That's right. So that initiated the group dynamics theory. Now, interestingly, when I was reading this, I, this ayah came to my mind where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim Allah knows best of course but maybe one of the interpretations of this ayah and Allah knows best of course I'm not here to interpret the Quran based on my theories and opinions wal a'udhu billah God forbid but possibly, as the hadith says, Quran has a zahir and a batin, has a, a clear message and a hidden message. And this hidden message is subdivided to further 70 hidden messages. Maybe one of the hidden messages of the Quran in this particular ayah could be that Allah is referring to this group, the dynamics, that when these groups slowly change, as a group, they have a better facilitation to change, better dynamics to change. Allahu A'lam. So that's as a group. What about an individual? Can one person change a group? Can you have one person influence a society, a community? Is that possible? Now we come to another American psychologist. His name is Abraham Maslow. Abraham Maslow started studying usually psychologists study people who are sick ill people trying to figure out why why are they ill and how to treat them maslow went the other way he did not study ill people in fact he studied healthy people not just any healthy people very successful healthy people people like einstein what makes einstein an einstein why can't everyone become an einstein why do certain people in the society become so successful? That they can influence their society, their community, and so on and so forth. So he was intrigued by this. So he started studying this. Are you changing the group dynamics here, brother? Are you changing the group dynamics here, inshallah? Putting it in action? Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Yeah, I guess we need to also change the group dynamics. They say anyone who's parked illegally, you'll be ticketed, by the way, you know. So you've got to change your group dynamics, by the way. Okay. Going back to the point, please. We have Abraham Maslow. So he started studying healthy people, successful people, people like Einstein. He developed then what he called a pyramid. A pyramid. He said... Yes, you can have one individual changing communities, changing societies, you can. Look at Einstein, for example, his theories. Certain people, their theories, they have influenced history for ages now. However, you need to provide them with certain basics, certain things in order for them to succeed. For example, he says at the base of the pyramid, you must give what he called physiological needs Every person needs food, water, air to breathe, etc. The basics of needs. If someone is dying of hunger, will this person have an opportunity to learn? No. In fact, research shows here in Canada, research in Canada shows that children who have breakfast in the morning, they usually score better in the exams and test results than those who don't have breakfast. They've shown this in the research. That's why some schools in Canada, when they have a special exam, you know, a standardized exam, a provincial exam or something like this happening, the school itself distributes breakfast to the children, the school at its own expense. It goes because they want to raise the average of the school. So when a person is hungry, it is difficult to think, to function. He says you must provide the basic physiological needs. Okay. 
That's one. Two, after you gave the basics, that's the base of the pyramid. Now you go up. You need to provide what he calls security. Security. Some of you may be familiar with areas in the world today, unfortunately, where they're suffering from lack of peace, lack of security. You might call some of your relatives and they'll tell you, you know what? We're so afraid to go outside the house. And when I go outside, I don't know if I'm gonna come back alive or not. In such fear, how can you accomplish anything? You're constantly living in fear. It is difficult. He says, you cannot do this. He says, you have to provide peace, security. Now, interestingly, those first two, the Quran gives some reference indirectly toward, to, to, to them as well, as necessities. In Surah Quraysh, do you guys memorize Surah Quraysh? Li'ilafi Quraishin, ilafihim, ihlata shita'i was saif, and then what? فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي what? I can't hear you. أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَاوٍ Allah is saying to Quraysh, I fed you and I provided you with peace and security. And hence Quraysh thrived. Quraysh among Arabia was thriving. Because Quraysh did not have to fear any attacks. It was in peace. Especially after what happened to Abraha, after the attack on the Kaaba by Abraha, as we read in Surah Al Fil, and the destruction of Abraha and his forces, the Arabian Peninsula, those tribes, they did not dare anymore to get anywhere near the Kaaba or Quraysh to attack them. So that incident gave Quraysh a further pride, further arrogance. That you cannot touch, you cannot mess with us. So Allah gave them that peace and they gave them the food. So Allah refers to those two things, interestingly, food and security. And that's what Maslow is also referring. He says you need to give food and security. Then Maslow says those two are not enough. You need something else. He says you must give what he calls the family, the love, the support, Someone must have some supporters, helpers, family members. Then the fourth stage, he says, is what he calls esteems. Esteem means you're encouraged. Encouragement. People are motivating you. They tell you, this is really good. Keep it up. Well done. So you're encouraged to continue further. Okay. Once you're provided with those four things, what did we say? First of all was what? Physiological needs. Second is what? Security. Third is what? Family or the love. And fourth is esteem. Esteem or that, that encouragement, etc. Once you have those four, then you can reach the peak of the pyramid. The peak. Which he calls self-actualization. Now you can really realize what are you good at? What am I really good at? I'm good at physics. I'm good at arts, I'm good at whatever, engineering, whatever it is. I can really uncover my potential and thrive, thrive. So an Einstein can become an Einstein. Someone like, for example, Da Vinci can become a Da Vinci, etc. That's how they achieve it. And hence they can really change societies. Okay. Now, so we have Kurt Lewin. Kurt Lewin, that first psychologist, he says, as a group, you can change the dynamics of the individual within a group. That's one. Abraham Maslow says an individual can change a group as well, but you need to provide him with these basics. He has to have this. Okay. That's interesting. So this is, these are theories, by the way, out there. You know, and they're studied until this day and age. I mean, these theories are about eight years old now, give or take. But they're heavily studied in psychology, they're taught. And these two people are very big names now in psychology. Now, interestingly, if we take a look at this, these theories, and then we come to Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam If you come to Ahlul Bayt, starting with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. 
I may request you please to move forward as much as you can. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. ثانية يرحمكم الله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ثالثة لتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان بأعلى أصواتكم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد When we come to Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وآله Did he have much peace? In Mecca, not much peace. He was thrown with stones. They threw him with stones. They tried to kill him. So he had to leave Mecca, went to Medina. Even in Medina, did they leave him alone? No. He's just gone to Medina. Quraysh raises an army and they fight against him. The first battle of Islam. Do you know what is the name of the first battle in Islam? First battle. What is the name? Anyone who's... Okay, better. Huh? Okay, so the next question, I want everyone who's 10 and under to answer, 10 and under. What is the second battle of Islam? You're 10 and under? I see some Wi-Fi signals being passed down here. No. Okay. Battle of Badr, the first battle. Then Uhud, a year later. A couple years later, Al-Ahzab or Al-Khandaq. And then so many other battles. So the Prophet was constantly attacked. And that's something I want you to understand. All the battles that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa fought were in defense. He was being attacked. Battle of Badr took place on the outskirts of Medina. Battle of Uhud took place on the outskirts of Medina. So he was attacked. When he's attacked, what do you do? You have to defend. Okay. Battle of Al-Ahzab, Al-Khandaq, took place in Medina, on the outskirts of Medina. You're attacked. What do you do? You have to defend yourself. I mean, every sovereign nation today reserves the right to defend itself when it's being attacked. In fact, some nations in the world today, they travel thousands of miles because they say there's a threat. Thousands of miles. There's a threat to our sovereignty, threat to our, for example, well-being. So we're going to go all the way there and fight over there. Isn't that what we're seeing in the world today? Okay. So the Prophet had to defend himself. Either he was attacked or there was a peace treaty between him and another group and they went against the terms of the treaty. Like what happened in Sulh al-Hudaybiyah. In the year 6 after Hijrah, the Prophet made a peace treaty with Quraysh. But they went against the peace treaty. They killed the Muslims when the deal was not to touch the Muslims. They killed them. So what did he do? He had to now defend. They went against the terms. So in the year 8 after Hijrah, he marched to Mecca and that was as a consequence to them what happened why did he go to Mecca because they violated the terms of the treaty it was their fault and when he went to Mecca did he kill anyone and this is really a beautiful example that we can give to people who say Islam is a violent religion or the Prophet ﷺ is a violent man we tell them show us one example in history one example of a leader, a conqueror, who goes to his enemies. These enemies fought against him for more than 20 years. They shot him with stones. They tried to kill him. They fought against him. They killed his dearest companions and relatives. His cousin, Ubaid ibn al-Harith, was killed in Badr. His uncle, al-Hamza, was killed in Uhud. Such people who constantly fought against him. Now, he has them all under siege. Not only that, they all surrender. They all put down their weapons, lay down their weapons. What does he do to them? You read history. See what do some conquerors do to such people. Read history. Look at the Mughals, for example, when they went to Iraq. What did they do? Not only sometimes the conqueror would kill the people. They come with so much rage, animosity, hatred that they would burn down an entire city. I mean, okay, you might kill the people because they might go against you. But why would you burn down the infrastructure? It's just the hatred. There's so much rage. They want to demolish everything. That's how conquerors come usually. The Prophet now comes as a conqueror, victorious. 
against people who fought against him for over 20 years. There in this people, amongst them is Abu Sufyan. Amongst them is Hind, the one who cut off his own uncle into pieces. She's right there, standing right there now. Helpless, powerless. Their weapons are laid down. What does he do to them? He looks at them and he says, Al -yawm, yawm al Today is a day of mercy. Rahmah. And he says, Idhabu fa antum Go. I free you all. I free you all. Show me one example in history, brothers and sisters. When you study history, inshallah, one day, give me one example, one example of a leader who is in such a case, he's got the upper hand and he lets everyone go free. Isn't this the absolute mercy? What better example do you want? So such examples where Ahlul Bayt alayhim wassalam. Nonetheless, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was living in times of difficulty. Then you come to Amirul Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi Imam Ali. Again, what was the situation like? Him and Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. Look how they attacked the house. As one Egyptian poet says, Egyptian. شاعر النيل يقول وقولة لعلي قالها فلان أكرم بسامعها أعظم بملقيها حرقت دارك ما أبقيت عليك بها إن لم تبايع وبنت المصطفى فيها ما كان سوى أبا فلان بقائلها أمام فارس عدنان وحاميها يعني يقول هذا بطل هذا الرجل بطل واقعا يعني يقول هذا بطل لأن من يجرؤ أن يتكلم بهذا الكلام أمام فارس عدنان أمام علي بن أبي طالب هذا هذا أنت له الجرأة الرجل this man he's saying this this poet is saying basically describing what happened between the second man and the house of فاطمة سلام الله عليها that I'm gonna burn your house down if you don't come to pledge your allegiance to the leaders leadership you know and the poet says this man the second man is such a hero he's a brave man because who dares to speak to Ali ibn Abi Talib in such a language he does look at look how brave he is when interestingly if you read Tariq al-Tabari Tariq al-Tabari Ibn Jarir al-Tabari he writes in the event of the seventh year after Hijrah the battle of Khaybar do me a favor go back home tonight and read the battle of Khaybar as written by Ibn Jarir al-Tabari. When the second man became the leader and he came back, he says, Ibn Jarir, يُجَبِّنُ الْقَوْمُ يُجَبِّنُونَ He came back, he tells Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, you sent me with a bunch of cowards. They say, Ya Rasulullah, he's the coward. He's, tell he's telling us we're cowards. He's That's what they say about him. Now, nonetheless, and Imam Ali السلام, says, I was all by myself. I did not have any supporters, no helpers. As he says in Khutbah Shakshakiyya, فَطَفِقْتُ أَرْتَئِي بَيْنَ أَنْ أَصُولَ بِيَدٍ جَذَّاءٍ وحيد. ما عنديش. أو أصبر على طخية عمياء يهرم فيها الكبير ويشيب فيها الصغير ويكدح فيها مؤمن حتى يلقى ربه. فرأيت أن الصبر على هاتا أحجى فصبرت وفي العين قذى وفي الحلق شجى أرى تراثي نهبا حتى مضى الأول إلى سبيله فأدلى بها إلى فلان بعده I was all alone he says in the third sermon of نهج البلاغة خطبة الشقشقية he says I'm all alone I do not have any supporters not only did we lack the security the house is being attacked not only do we lack the supporters, no supporters. And the same thing applies to the rest of the Imam, Salam Allah alayhi. Look at what happened to Imam al Hussein, Salam Allah alayhi, in Karbala. What did they do to him? Imam al Kadhim, Salam Allah alayhi. How many years in imprisonment? Imam al Askariyain, alayhi salam, both of them. In the city of military compound, 
constant surveillance, constant monitoring. They're constantly being persecuted, constantly being driven out of their countries. Yet, despite all this, we find them not obeying the laws as described by those psychologists. They did not, how, subhanAllah, they managed to influence society, not just a community, generations until this day and age, they are influencing them. They're changing the world to the point where there is a Christian poet, not a Muslim, Christian, Lebanese poet. He says, لا تقل شيعة هو تعليا إن في كل منصف شيعية جلجل الحق في المسيحي حتى قد عد من فرط حبه علويا فإن لم يكن علي النبي فلقد كان خلقه نبويا فيا سماء اشهدي ويا أرض قري واخشعي إني أحب عليا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد You move up closer, please, again. Jazakumullah khaira. Ahsantum. Please, try to move as much as you can. Jazakumullah khaira. We have room here on the steps as well, you know. You can come up here as well, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So how is it that they are influenced the society? Again, you have another Christian man, George Jordak, or Jordak. He wrote a book about Imam Ali, Imam Ali, the voice of a human justice. It's available in English as well. It's been translated. My brothers and my sisters tried to read this book. It's an interesting book. The perspective of someone who is not a follower of Ahlul Bayt, not even a Muslim. It gives you his own perspective of Ali ibn Abi Talib. It tells you how mesmerized he is with the greatness of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Alayhi, as a leader. And he says, I am proud to be an Arab, to belong to, Ar to, uh, to Arabs, because Ali ibn Abi Talib is an Arab. I'm proud to have such a leader. That's what he says, a Christian man. Another Christian man writes about Imam al Hussein in Christian ideology. Antoine Barra, it's written in the book. So you find them influencing societies, communities for generations to come. About a year ago, I was invited to give a talk at a city hall in the city of Edmonton, Alberta. There were some dignitaries sitting down there, some professors, etc. It was an interfaith kind of initiative. Among the things I said were, I said that we as Muslims respect humanity at large. This is the basics of our teachings. And I told them, one of our leaders, Imam Ali alayhi salam, who is the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad and his son-in-law and his divine successor. He says to his governor in Egypt, that be aware people in this world are of two types. They're either your brothers and sisters in faith or your counterpart in humanity. So I said this. After the lecture, two people approached me. One of them says, I am a professor at the university here. I was so moved by the statement of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imam Ali, that you quoted. I'm going to teach it to my students and to my children. Then the second man comes and he says, I am a Jewish poet. A poet. Jewish poet. He says, I'm inspired by these words that you quoted of Imam Ali. That I'm going to use it as an inspiration for some of my poetry. That made me think for a second. I said, subhanallah, if one sentence from Nahjul Balagha influenced those people, what happens if we introduce all of Nahjul Balagha to them? What's going to happen? It's going to change the world. But unfortunately, we're not doing the job. 
Fortunately, it's our fault. We're not introducing Nahjul Balagha. That's what Imam al-Sadiq says in a hadith. Tell people about us. Talk to them about us. Introduce them to us. For if they were to recognize us, they'll follow us. But it's our fault. How come? Why do these people, Ahlul Bayt alayhim do not follow those observations made by these psychologists? They don't. Fo how come they don't follow the norms? Abraham Maslow says you need to have security, you need to have esteem, you need to have encouragement in order for you to excel. Well, they don't have security. They've been imprisoned, they've been killed, they've been persecuted. They don't have supporters. They don't have p people. Imam al Hussein on the day of Ashura is calling, Halman Nasr Liyan Suruna, Halman. Nobody. Nobody's out there. Okay. Salamullah alayhi. So they don't. How, how come then they, they made it? Because of their ikhlas. They believed in Allah. They gave everything they have for the sake of Allah. So Allah chose them. Those are known as Ibadullah al Mukhlasin. Not Mukhlasin. Mukhlasin with a fatha. Those who gave everything they have for the sake of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the laws for them. They don't follow the norms. And that's what the ayah we recited earlier in Surah As Saf. Verse number eight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yuriduna liyutfi u nur Allah bi afwahihim wallahu mutimmu nurihi walaw kariha al kafirun. Nurullah. They are Nurullah. Their words are Nurullah, Anwar. Kalamukum nur. Nurun ala nur. Read Tafsir al-Burhan with the ayah of An-Nur in Surah An-Nur. See the ahadith he narrates from As-Sadiq alayhi salam and the other imams about how among the interpretation is that they are Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam They are the Nur. They are Nurullah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives two examples in the Quran. Well, in fact, sorry, he gives several examples in the Quran. We'll just take a look quickly at two of them. Where we see when individuals, they are sincere in their actions, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will choose them and will facilitate things to them. One example is Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Are you familiar with Surah Yusuf? In one of the verses towards the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kadalika kidna li Yusuf. That's how we planned for Yusuf. Innahum yakiduna kaydan wa akidu kayda. Allah says in another surah. People plan, but I also plan. And usually the plan of Allah prevails. Okay. Allah says we allowed Yusuf to have his brother to become the king. That was our plan. They planned. The brothers planned. But Allah had a plan. Now, if we read Surah Yusuf, brothers and sisters, if, we, if it was not a surah in the Quran, the story of Prophet Yusuf, if it, were a, if it were a novel, if you pick up a novel and you read, if it were not from the Quran, if, hypothetically speaking, then people would say, you know, this is impossible. How could it? Some, a man, a boy is thrown into the well. Then he's taken out of the well. Then he goes to the king or the king's palace. Then he's thrown into the prison. And in the prison, he had a companion. Okay, the companion leaves. Well, he forgets to tell the king about Yusuf. Oh, the king sees a dream. Oh, and the dream reminds him, reminds that other companion that, oh yeah, there is a Yusuf, by the way. I mean, you think this is impossible. But subhanAllah, this is how Allah plans things which may seem to be difficult, but to Allah, they're not difficult. Allah makes the king dream, and that dream reminds the companion about Yusuf alayhi salam. Then there is a drought. Now the brothers of Yusuf come. Now that's how he see them. If you put them all together, subhanAllah, it's an amazing story. But that's how Allah plans. This does not follow the norms. 
And Allah describes Yusuf as mukhlasin. He is among the mukhlasin, those who are sincere, those who give everything for the sake of Allah. So Allah chooses them. That's one example. A second example is Ibrahim alayhi salam. Qulna ya naru kuni bagdan wa salama. Again, that doesn't follow the norms. Ibrahim was thrown to the fire. The fire should have destroyed him. But subhanallah, nothing happened. The laws were changed. Just to give you an example here, just to draw the picture closer here. But again, as I say in Arabic, al-amthalu tudrab wa la tuqas. You just give an example as an analogy. About a century ago, in the early 20th century, scientists, physicists discovered the atom. Or, you know, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, that's when they started to discover the atom. Those of you who study physics at the universities, you're familiar with that. When they discovered the atom, they realized, those physicists, realized that the laws they have of physics are not good enough anymore. What they had was what's known today as Newtonian classical physics. The Newtonian by Isaac Newton, 400 years ago approximately. These laws that were given of physics from 400 years ago, classical physics, they're not good enough anymore. They need new language. They have to come up with a whole new way because what they're dealing with is something that does not follow the classical system. So they invented, physicists then, invented what's known as the quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics. What is quantum mechanics? That's basically to deal a language to understand and deal with the atom. They can deal with the atom. And hence you had Schrodinger, you had Heisenberg, you had other people now starting to formulate these theories. Quantum mechanics. Okay. And quantum theories. If we apply the same analogy, the classical language and the norms and the theories do not apply to Ahlul Bayt alayhim was salah. In fact, do not apply to those who are sincere to Allah. They have a completely new language. Completely new one. Because of their sincerity and ikhlas. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, when you have people who are so great, like Ahlul Bayti alayhim was salam, who are so influential, who can really move people who are not even Muslims as we come across. Christians are moved by them. Then the question comes, why don't we implement them in our lives? How come? A lot of people in this day and age, especially the youth, they feel there's a disconnection from Ahlul Bayti alayhim was salam. They say that, you know what? Okay, I know you're telling me the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt, they're great people, great personalities, absolutely. But Fatima al Zahra, she lived 1400 years ago in a different society. Today I live here in Ottawa, Canada, in the 21st century. I have all these gadgets, all this technology around me. That was not there at that time. Today, the fashion has changed. Today, we have Gucci, Versace, Dolce Gabbana, Maimana, Hadunana, all these things, we have them all. That was not there. So how can you want me to relate to someone from 1400 years? It doesn't apply. It, that's where we feel a disconnection. To answer this argument, I'll give you two examples very briefly. One is a general example. Have you guys heard of a person called Aristotle? Who was Aristotle? Aristotle is a Greek philosopher, very famous. He lived more than 2,000 years ago. Among the things he invented was something very important. It's called logic. Logic. I don't know if m some of you have logic, but anyways, you know, we'll, we'll work on that, inshallah. No. What is logic? I'll give you a very simple example of logic, very simple. I'll give you two sentences. Based on these two sentences, you give me the conclusion you can derive. First sentence. All horses have tails. Second sentence. Jane is a horse. Therefore, Jane has what? Oh, mashallah, you guys are psychic. How did you figure that out? That's called logic. That's called logic. That's a basic form of logic. Aristotle is the father of it. He invented this. And a lot of people 
over the past, this was over 2,000 years ago. Today, if you go to any university in the world that gives a PhD, a degree that's a PhD, what is a PhD? A doctor of what? Philosophy, doctor of philosophy. You're not considered to be a doctor of chemistry or a doctor of engineering, you're a doctor of philosophy. Why? Because the scientists will examine you or the experts will examine you and they will say this individual has now reached the ability to examine the data, the research that he does or she does and derive logical conclusions based on the data. And that's why they grant you a PhD. That's what it is. Doctor of philosophy. So Aristotle is influencing our society 2000 years later. Not only in the universities, in the Hawzat, the Islamic seminary, one of the first early courses the students of Hawza study is a course called Mantiq, logic. Because they need it in the seminary to derive laws. So can anyone say that Aristotle 2000 years ago, who cares about him anymore? That's a long time ago. Not at all. He's still there, he's influencing his ideologies, his ideas are still being alive. How does he compare to Fatima Sallallahu Alaihi Nothing. Fatima is much greater than Aristotle Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Second, Quran says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ In the example of the Prophet is a role model. That's happening until the day of judgment. So Quran is saying the Prophet is a role model. You cannot say that he was 1400 years ago. Quran says no. He's relevant in the 21st century. He's relevant in the 30th century. Whenever it is, he's still relevant. How so? Society usually has problems. Society has problems. Every society. There are financial problems, social problems, political problems, etc. How do we solve these problems? We have to address them. So people usually try to address these issues. One of the ways in which we can address these issues is by studying the lives of people in the past and learning from them and implementing lessons. I'll give you an example again. When I was in my undergraduate degree studying my undergrad, in the first year, English. We had to study a play, a Shakespearean play. It starts with an H. Do you guys familiar with it? Hamlet, exactly. So it's not a tricky question here. Hamlet, I, guess, I don't know how many of you have read Hamlet. You know, you've read Hamlet? You know, this, this guy, you know, if you don't know Hamlet, it's the to be or not to be guy. If you're to be or not to be, that is the question, that's Hamlet, you know. Back in those days, when I was, you know, back in the Jurassic era when I was an undergraduate student, you know, talking about so many decades ago. Uh, back in those days, I was talking to my teacher one day, and she said that as of today, you know, back in those days, as of today, there are about 3,000 research articles written about Hamlet. 3,000 research articles by university students, by scholarly articles, academics, written about Hamlet. I told her, 3,000 articles written about Hamlet? She said, yes. I told her, but why? The guy is fiction. He's not even real. He's the creation of Shakespeare, for God's sake. I mean, you write 3,000 articles about Shakespeare, maybe, okay, I can understand that part. At least he's real. He was a genius, he was a smart man, he was a good poet, etc. But 3,000 articles about a creation of Shakespeare, Hamlet. She said, no, we have to. Why? Those of you who've read the story, you know, you realize Hamlet had some emotional problems. He had some psychological issues as well. She said, we need to understand what caused these problems in Hamlet. Because then we can apply it to the society at large. There are people in the society who have psychological problems, have emotional problems. So how can we deal with them? See what I'm saying? Are you following me? So by studying Hamlet, we can then derive lessons that we can implement in the society at large. Are you with me? Hamlet is fiction. He's not even real. But that's what they do. This is scholarly. That's a scholarly approach. 
So then why not we use the same approach to Ahlul Bayt Salamullahi Alayhim? They're the best of Allah's creation. If the academia, academics accept that approach, they accept it. You can study a fictional character, not even a real character, to derive lessons from his life, fictional life, that you can implement in the real world. Then why not study real people, the best of Allah's creation, to derive lessons? We can do it. The problem is, do you know what? Us. We feel the disconnection with them. Otherwise, they're relevant to us, even in this day and age. Look at Fatima, salamullahi alayha, this great lady, this noble woman. Look at her hijab. We'll take a look at this one aspect of hers. Okay. So, so far, my brothers and sisters, just to recap, we say that Scholars usually, psychologists say that when you are among a group, then you act differently from being an individual. But as an individual, can you influence a whole group, a whole society? And the answer is yes, according to contemporary psychologists. But you must have certain criteria. There are certain things, the things that we mentioned by mass law. If you provide these things, then you can. Ahlul Bayti alayhim salam did not have these things, did not have the security, did not have the encouragement, the support of the people, yet they still managed. How come? Because they are individuals who believed in Allah. They had ikhlas. And hence, the laws that apply to them are different from the classical laws. Okay. As we see in the Quran, give an example, for example, by Yusuf alayhi salam and Ibrahim, where they did not, they did not follow the classical laws. Okay. Ahlul Bayti alayhi salam are relevant in this day and age. We can look at their lives, study their lives, and implement them in this day and age. They are relevant because academics do so. They study fictional characters that were written 400 years ago by some individuals and they try to derive lessons from them in this day and age. So then why can't we do the same thing with Ahlul Bayt, Salamullahi Alayhim Ajma'een? Plus, when you have personalities such as Aristotle, who can influence society until this day and age, 2,000 years later, then why can't Ahlul Bayt, Alayhim Salam, influence societies until this day and age? And one example, we'll take a look at a way where we can derive lessons from Ahlul Bayt and apply them in our lives is the hijab of Fatima al Zahra alayha salam. Today there is a major social issue with the concept of hijab. In fact, it's an issue not only with Muslims, with non-Muslims as well. What do I mean? There are several research papers today published. One of them is by a lady called Shelley Grabe, G-R-A-B, as in boy, E, Grabe. Shelley Grabe, in 2008, she published a paper in a journal called Psychological Bulletin. In that paper, in that paper, she discussed the role of the media portrayal of women and its impact on women how the media portrays the woman, and how is that impacting women. In that paper, she says, 50% of university girls and younger suffer from psychological, emotional, and physical distress because of the images they see of women being portrayed on television, on the internet, on the media, and they look at themselves and they say, you know, we don't fit this image anymore. So what happens? They start suffering from psychological problems, emotional problems, physical problems, anorexia, where they, they stop eating anymore, is among the problems they face. And it starts, listen to this one, it starts as young as age seven. Girls as young as age seven, they start looking at themselves and say, I am not beautiful anymore. This is research. This is not some Muslim writing this. This is academic research written by an American. But it's there. 
It's in academia. This is research. Another author, another author writes, he says, communication theories suggest that continuous perception of media, television, internet, makes us perceive what we see as the reality. The reality. What you see on television, when you continuously see it, observe it on the internet, on television and the advertisements, slowly what happens to you? You start to think this is reality. This is how it should be. It's how things should run. And this is causing a major social problems in the society today. They're complaining of it. The way the women are being dressed, the way they are being objectified, made an object, an object. And there's another paper about that as well. Several papers, books have been written about this issue. The objectification of women, how they're objectified in the media, and how that reflects then on other women and girls. So they are complaining. This is a problem now, a huge problem today. It's causing psychological problems, emotional problems, physical problems. Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam comes to say, put on your hijab. And you don't have to worry about what the others think of you. It's what you think of yourself. And that's why in a hadith, which some people find it controversial, but given in this context, we can understand what she's talking about. She's, she says the best thing for a woman is that she never sees a man or a man sees her. People say, how is that possible? You know, how is that? In this context, now we understand what she means. Not to see her as an object, but as a person. As a person. Otherwise, Fatima al-Zahra spoke to people. She spoke to Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari. Who taught us dua? Or hadith al-Kisa? Who taught us? If you read hadith al-Kisa, what does it say? An Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, an who? An Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Which means he listened to her. She taught him. But she taught him with the proper manners, the boundaries of Sharia. Ah. It wasn't that she was sitting down having coffee with him, joking around, or smoking shisha with him. Well, Ayyadu Billah. No. Professional environment, teaching him. She had conversations in the past with Salman, Allah Ta'ala Alayh. So she teaches them, absolutely, no problem. But don't make them feel that you are an object. You. Have to be strong, have a lot of self-esteem and confidence. You set the fashion, because now some of our sisters, they say, I have to wear the hijab in this particular form. Tight clothings, put the makeup on. Why? Because this is the fashion, I have to do this. Otherwise, I'm perceived differently. You set the fashion, you set the tone. You set it, don't be lacking confidence in yourself you can make a difference if you believe in yourself and follow the path of allah if you become sincere with allah allah will bless you i know a mu'min and this applies to the brothers as well huh the brothers as well same issues a few weeks ago i was talking to somebody who works in a major corporation major corporation in canada these guys make billions of dollars a year major corporation this person told me when the company has a lunch or a social, so those of you who work in some companies, you know that sometimes around Christmas or around certain times, the company will throw in a social. This person came and told me there are some Muslim men who attend these socials and they drink alcohol. And I would go tell them, aren't you Muslim? He says, yes, I'm a Muslim. Why are you drinking? He says, don't you know that's haram? I know it's haram. And I don't drink outside of work, to be honest with you. I only drink at work. Well, why are you drinking at work? Because if I don't drink, I'm not gonna get promoted. If I don't drink, I don't get promoted. Did you see this mentality? This is reality, huh? This is not serious. Who is the razzaq? Who gives you the rizq? Allah. Why do you compromise your faith, your religion to get promoted? Who cares about the promotion? And if you're good, you will be promoted, by the way. If you're good, you will be promoted. Because you're good. I know a mu'min, a brother. 
He says, I went for an interview to medical school. You know how difficult it is to get into medical school in this country? So difficult. You have to have high, high GPA. You have to write the MCAT or the test. And then you go for an interview and so on and so forth. He went to the interview stage. So he made it to that stage, the interview. He said, when I went to the interview, there were five people. Three men, two ladies. They came at the beginning of the interview. They wanted to shake my hand. I shook the men's hand. When it came to the ladies, I told them, you know what, I'm sorry. My religion doesn't allow me to shake hands. So I'll just greet you this way. He told me the story. When he told me this, I told him, weren't you worried? Weren't you afraid? I mean, this is your interview for God's sake. These guys will determine whether you get in or you don't get in. Weren't you afraid that if you, shake the, if you don't shake the hands, they won't let you in? This is your career, medical school. You know what he answered? He said, no. I'll do whatever Allah is pleased with. I will not compromise my faith. If Allah wants me to get in, I'll get in. If he doesn't, khalas, he has something better planned for me. Then I don't need to get in. I don't need to worry about it. Two months later, he called me. Two months later, he said, I got my acceptance letter. I'm in. And today he's a practicing medical doctor, today, here in Canada. Why do you compromise? Why do you feel weak? Be strong. This is my faith. And I have nothing to be ashamed of. I have nothing to be afraid of. I'm confident. What I'm, I'm following Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam The best of Allah's creation. I am proud to have a leader such as Ali ibn Abi Talib, who the Christian feels proud of being an Arab because Ali is an Arab. A Christian man. So why should I not be proud to follow Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi Why should I not be proud to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam? Fatima to Zahra, this great lady, this personality, who if we implement her teachings, just about one aspect, and that is the aspect of hijab, she can solve so many problems that people and academics are writing about today. Psychological problems because of the perception. I have to objectify myself. Why would you objectify yourself? You're not an object. Allah has honored you. Allah says we honored the human, the children of Adam. You're honored. Don't lower yourself. You say this is who I am with my hijab and the proper hijab. I will live, wear the hijab covering my whole body with the exception of the face and the hands up to the wrist. No makeup. The clothes are loose. Socially, whether I'm online, I will look at a woman with dignity and respect. I will not objectify her because that's how Islam wants me to look at her. I will be proud of following my faith. When you do so, believe me, you'll live a good life, a happy life. I'm not saying you will live a trouble-free life. No. You will have problems in your life. No one lives. أَحَسِبَ nas أَيُّتْرَكُوا أَيَّقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ do people think that we will let them say that I am a mu'min without being tested? We will test you. You will be tested. Maybe one day you will lose your job. Maybe. You might lose your job one day because of your hijab. Maybe. Or because of your aqeedah. Maybe. You might lose it. But be proud. You, will, you might experience problems. In fact, you will experience problems. But you stay strong. Because remember, you're obeying Allah. And you're following Ahlul Bayt. So stay strong. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Allah will help me through it. One of the ulama says, I always pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a haja. When I have a haja, I say, Ya Allah, help me. I want this issue, for example. He says, if he gives it to me, I'm happy. If he doesn't, I'm happier. He asked him, why? How come? He says, because this haja, this thing I wanted, I wanted this. But Allah chose something else for me, which means he will choose something even better. And believe me, I come across so many people. Sometimes, you know, they come to me, they say, Sheikh, you know, I applied for this job and I've been looking for a job for six months, for example, or sometime. I can't find the job, Sheikh, you know, and, and this was a really good job. I missed it. Why? Why, Sheikh? How come? Why wouldn't Allah listen to me? Believe me, I come across people like this. And then a month later, a month really, a month later, the same man comes to me. He says, Sheikh, you know what? Alhamdulillah, I did not get that job. That job, it turned out that it involves a lot of traveling. 
a lot of traveling, so it means I had to spend a lot of time away from my family, my children. Now I got a better job in a better company, and I don't have to travel. I told him, see, you were complaining last month. Last month you were complaining, why didn't I get this job? I've been praying, so on. That's why Allah didn't give you this job, because Allah knew what's better for you. You did not know what's better for you. So you will experience problems in life. I'm not saying your life will be trouble-free. You had a smooth ride. We will experience problems, all of us. But when we have Ahlul Bayt with us, then we'll be happy. You find them, Salamullahi alayhim ajma'een. All of Ahlul Bayt. Look at how many problems they had to face. How many issues they had to go through. And they are the best of Allah's creation. The Prophet ﷺ sits on the member towards the end of his life and says, "Ma mithli qat." No prophet has been ha bothered and harassed like the way I've been bothered and harassed. No one. Imam Ali Allah Look at his life. Towards the end of his life in Nahjul Balagha, it is said, a man asked Imam Ali Allah Ya Amir al Mu'minin, "Lima la tastakhdim al khidab? Why don't you dye your beard?" Why don't you dye your beard? Why do, what does he respond? This is the end of his life. Qala al khidabu zina. Al khidabu zina. Wa inna fi azaa. Aw wa nahnu fi azaa. He says to dye the beard is a sign of ornament. No, like you know, you dye your beard, you're happy a little bit. I'm in grief. We are in grief. Al-Sharif al-Radhi, Allah Ta'ala Ali, the one who compiled it, he puts a comment. He says, this is maybe the loss of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi. You know, 30 years later, the Prophet died in the year 11 after Hijrah. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen Sallallahu Alaihi was martyred in the year 40 after Hijrah. So almost 30 years later, he's saying we're in Aza. Another commentator says, no, it's not only Rasulullah, also Fatima. Because when he buried her, Salamullah alayhi, he says, Qala inna huzni la sarmad. My grief is for eternity. 30 years after burying, he's still in, in pain, he's in grief. Imagine this life. How much difficulty they had to go through. Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, Imam al Sajjah, and all the way up to our Imam Salamullah. How much difficulties they are going through. Really, they're our role models. Why did they go through all these problems? So that you and I can follow this religion, implement their lives in our lives. So really, aren't they worth for us to sacrifice a little bit makeup and put on my hijab? I should not listen to haram music. I should not implement their lives in my, aren't they worth it? Believe me, I mean, you tell me, what do you think? After all they've given for us, one of the ulama, whenever he wanted to pray every day before a wajib salat, before he says, Allahu Akbar, he would say, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah al Hussein. And then he would say, Allahu Akbar. They asked him one day, why do you keep on saying this? He says, because if it weren't for the sacrifice of Imam al Hussein, I would not have the salat. I would not have salat. Ashhadu annaka qad aqamtal salat. One of the meanings, definitions of this word, of the statement, is that you established the salat, you maintained it, the integrity of the salat. Otherwise, salat, you know, there would be no salat. Aqamta salat. They went through a lot of problems, a lot of difficulty. Fatima al Zahra, salamullahi alayha, this great lady. And we're also these days commemorating the wafat of Umm al Banin, salamullahi alayha, as well. Both of those ladies, great personalities. How much difficulties they experienced. How much problems they went through. Fatima was ma'asuma, infallible. After her father would take Hassan and Hussein alayhim as -salam, would go and sit on the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. She would take some of the sand and smell it. Today we can't even go near that grave anymore, unfortunately. But inshallah, Allah will bring the victory again to Muslims, inshallah. And we will see the day, insha'Allah, when these shrines are built again, insha'Allah. She would sit on that grave, take some of the sand and smell it. And subhanAllah, it has such a beautiful fragrance, subhanAllah. 
and she would talk to the grave. She would talk to Rasulullah. This is her poetry. This is not some poet saying. She would say, قل للمغيب تحت أطباق الثراء إن كنت تسمع صرختي وندائي صبت علي مصائب لو أن صبت على الأيام صرنا ليالي Oh my father, Ya Rasulallah, the calamities I faced after you, the tragedies I experienced. If you were to throw these calamities on the day, it would change into night because it would not be able to bear them. And on her final day, she came to Amir al Mu'mineen, Salamullah alayhi, and said, Ya Ali, today I'll be joining my father Rasulullah, Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Ya Ali, Edfuni Laylan, Eda Namat al Ayun, Wahajat al Abu Saya. Bury me in the middle of the night and don't let those people who attacked me, who took my right away from me to attend my funeral and then hide and cover my grave for I don't want them to even know where am I buried. The daughter of Rasulullah at the age of 18, subhanallah, this young lady. At the age of 18, look at the difficulties, the calamities she witnessed, and look how much she gave us. Imagine if she were allowed, she were let to leave, to live long, how much we would have benefited from Fatima, salamullahi alayha. She says, bury me and cover and hide my grave. And you know how Imam Ali responds? He says, naam ya sayyidati. He says, yes, my master. Ali ibn Abi Talib is telling Fatima, you are my ma Sayyidati. Although he was the Imam of her time after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Look at the greatness of this lady. And then she continues, she says, Ya Ali wa alayka min ba'di bil hasani wal husan. فَإِنَّهُمَا مِنْ بَعْدِ يَتِيمَا بِالْأَمْسِ فَقَدَا جَدَّهُمَا وَالْيَوْمْ يَفْقُدَانْ أُمَّهُمَا Oh Ali, take care after me of my sons Hassan and Hussein. It was only a few days ago they lost their grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Today they will lose their mother Fatima. I say, Ya Mawlati, Ya Zahra, I wish you were there to see Hassan and Hussein. Hassan was fed the poison and his body was shot with arrows, Salamullah alayhi. And Hussein was killed into pieces in Karbala. Uh, Imam Ali said, Naam, Ya Sayyidat, yes, Ya Fatima, we'll take care of everything. After finishing what she had to tell him, أمير المؤمنين لف ذا هاوس أسماء بنت عميس قالت كنت مع فاطمة سلام الله عليها I was with Fatima when she told me, Ya Asma, I will go rest for a little while. After some time, call me. If I respond to you, then it shall be so. But if I don't respond, then be aware I have joined my father, Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Asma said, I sat down after some time, I called her, Ya Mawlat, Ya Zahra, Ya Taqul Ma Ajabatni, she never replied back to me. I called her again, Ya Sayyidati, Ya Bint Rasulillah. Oh, daughter of Rasulullah, she did not reply back to me. I went to her room, I removed the cover from her face. I saw Fatima has joined her father Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Ya Shia, a'adham Allah lakum al-ajr bistishad al-zahra. Rahim Allah al-munadi, aywa Fatima ta. أيوة شهيدة أيوة سيدة 
اسماء سيدات ذات مومنت حسنا حسين كيم باك انتو ذا هاوس امام الحسن عليه السلام اسك مي يا اسماء اين امنا فاطمة I didn't know what to tell him. I said to him, my master, your mother has gone in a deep sleep. He said, Ya Asma, ma hada waqtu naumi ummina Fatima. This is not the time of sleep of our mother Fatima. He ran to his mother's room. He removed the cover from her face. Then he cried. He shouted, Akhi إن أمنا ميتة فجاء الحسين إلى حجرة أمه رمى بنفسه على جسدها يقبل يديها وقدميها وينادي أمه أنا عزيزك الحسين أجيبيني فجعل يبكيان ثم قاما they started crying weeping then they got up running to the masjid of Rasulullah Salman saw them he said what is the matter of children of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alih they said ya Salman عجباً للسماء من طبقت على الأرض لقد ماتت أمنا فاطب it is strange that the skies haven't yet collapsed on the earth our mother Fatima has died ya Salman Amir al-Mu'mineen then crushed back to the house crying Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon And the tragedies continued Wa istabarrat al-ma'asi حتى رجع الناعي يوما ينادي يا أهل يثرب لا مقام لكم بها قتل الحسين فأدمعي مدراء الجسم منه بكربلاء مضرج والرأس منه على القناة يدار يقول جاءتني امرأة تحمل على كتفها طفلة قلت من هذه قيل لي يا بشر عليك بها إنها أم البنين ارفق بحالها جاءتني ما سألتني عن أولادها بل قالت لي يا بشر أخبرني عن ولدي الحسين هل رجع الحسين سالما يقول ما دريت ما أقول لها لها قلت لها سيدتي أصغر أولاد قد قتل في كربلاء قالت ما سألتك عنه أخبرني عن الحسين فجعلت أعدد لها مصائب أولادها حتى قلت لها يا أم البنين عظم الله لك الأجر بمصاب أب الفضل العباس يقول فرمت بالغلام من على كتفها إلى الأرض قالت يا بشر لقد مزقتني يا قلبي أخبرني عن ولد الحسين كلهم فداء للحسين قلت لا يا أم البنين عظم الله لك الأجر بمصاب أبي عبد الله الحسين نادت أيوة ولداه أيوة حسينا أيوة شهيد أنا لقعد على درب الضعون وأناشد ليرحون ويجو كل من له غياب يلفون وأنا غايب باللحد مدفون لا تدعوني ويكي أم البنين تذكريني باليوث العريب كانت بنون لي أدعى بهم واليوم أصبحت ولا من بنين يا ليت الشعر أكما أخبروا بأن عباسا قطيع اليمين إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين شيخنا ولا تفضل بالدعاء تفضل شيخنا شيخ لا فاضل بالدعاء تفضل ولا شيخنا عزيز تفضل شيخنا تفضل عفوا فعايديكم بالدعاء this is the time when dua inshallah is accepted here you are the guests of فاطمة الزهراء سلام الله عليها 
الكثير من المؤمنين طلبوا الدعاء خصوصا في العراق في البحرين في اليمن في بلدان التي تعاني من عدم الاستقرار واقعا يطلبون منا الدعاء بعض المؤمنين المبتلين بامراض ارفعوا ايديكم نحن كلنا اصحاب حوائج اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم ten times together يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات شاف وعاف جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات على الخصوص من أوصونا بالدعاء منهم اللهم اقض حوائجهم شاف مرضاهم احفظهم في أوطانهم وديارهم بحفظك ورحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم نقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة إلا ما جعلتنا وذريتنا إلى يوم الدين من شيعة الزهراء المتقين يا الله ومن خدمتها المخلصين يا الله وارزقنا شفاعتها في الدنيا وفي القبر وفي الآخرة برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى أبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا هو قائدا هو دليلا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوى وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إلى لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغمة عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان لا سيما إلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات على الخصوص إلى روح المرحوم السيد علي الموسوي وأحمد الحسناوي وبلال الحسناوي وإلى أرواح جميع الجالسين والحاضرين والمؤسسين والباذلين لا سيما إلى روح سيداتنا وموالينا فاطمة الزهراء وأم البنين سلام الله عليهما رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات